Um, thanks for having me here. In this session, we'll be discussing data security fundamentals that would give us some knowledge on how we can protect the data we have, the data we create. Um, this is just a short summary about who I am. My name is Samaila, and I work um, within the cybersecurity industry. Uh, my focus is on cybersecurity awareness and building a cybersecurity culture within organizations. Um, I have a few qualifications there on the screen, and you can look at that your own time. Oops. So we'll be looking at um, you know the world, the, the working environment today, and how we've been forced to accelerate digital adoption across many countries in the world. We will look at CIA triad. We will look at um, how the cyber criminals operate. We try to understand their tricks and techniques. We will also look at how cyber attacks affect us, the potential impacts that we, that um, could um, occur if we become victims of cyber attacks. We will learn about the cyber security pillars, or information security pillars, and then we'll discuss the steps we can take. You know to protect ourselves from this little guy in the hoodie on, a, on the right side of the screen. So yeah, this is where we are today. We're now in a world where um, we're forced to collaborate, you know, via the internet. We are now isolated from each other in a lot of organizations. We are forced to leverage technology to do virtually everything, right? We can't do anything, almost anything without technology, you know, from e-commerce to banking, to gaming, entertainment, work, communication. I mean, you name it, anything right now needs to be done online. And um, while the world was gradually getting where we are right now, you know, thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of people who were not looking for, they were not yet ready to become digital natives or digital citizens, we're kind of pushed, you know, by reality to, to do that. So, for instance, if you take um, my country, Nigeria, for instance, and many other countries in Africa, and in fact, and around the world, if I may say, we saw a lot of situations where schools who were, that were not leveraging, for instance, video conferencing, or were not leveraging online resources in terms of how they submit assignments and take tests and things like that, were now forced to go that route. And what this meant, or what this what, what happened was that a lot of these teachers who are not as tech savvy, or who may be tech savvy, but do not have security knowledge, we're all required to use the internet without necessarily getting any safety training or any internet security training. And what this, what, 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 you know, and this can also be applied to the students as well. While they may be more tech savvy or more familiar with technology, many of them do not also have the required safety knowledge. We can apply this same concept to the work environment, whereas in the typical office where you have your IT department that, that secures the network and protects the endpoints, the computers, you know, in a work from home scenario, you are kind of partially responsible for some certain extent of security of your device and the information that you're working with. And so what this has done is that we've seen where, like I said, people are forced to work from home. There's now increasing um, remote work. So we are seeing where people are, it's becoming easier to get jobs across borders, you know. Um, there's rapid technology adoption, like I mentioned, without adequate preparation or training. We've seen a lot of companies adopting the cloud and other um, you know, emerging technologies to get work done and done faster. But we're also there's also the downside. We're having more cases of people getting burnt out because maybe they are working for longer hours or they can't seem to separate work from personal stuff anymore. And other things like that. And we also seen companies that have struggled, which has led to um, downsizing. You know, a popular example was in the football world in, in Spain, where there was some you know, downsizing and money issues happening. And there are so many examples around the world. But what this has done is that this guy now has many more targets. So I mentioned the students who do not have required safety training, I mentioned the teachers who may not even be tech savvy in the first place, you know, and even parents and other groups of or, or demographics, maybe the older people who are more um, vulnerable, if I may put it that way, and other targeted um, demographic are now all available online for this guy and his friends to, uh, to target or to attack 
right? And so this is why this kind of discussion is very important so that we're not mistakenly or unknowingly making ourselves easy targets for the bad guys. And so I'll talk a bit about what information security is before we get into who the bad guys are and what they do. In information security, or, and some people call it, you know, there are variants. Some people say digital security, cyber security, computer security. You know, these are in some way synonyms or siblings, if I may use that word. But it generally refers to the protection of data or information from damage, tampering, you know, abuse or unauthorized access in one way or the other, or even theft as well. So, and when we're looking at this, we consider three main things, right? And this is what we mean by the CIA I mentioned earlier in the agenda. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Confidentiality refers to, you know, protecting, um, um, sorry, granting access to a resource to only those who are authorized to see it. So it, it has to do with keeping things private, ensuring that only authorized people can access it. Integrity means only authorized people should be able to modify it or change it. So if someone that does, shouldn't have access can change something, then that thing is said to not have integrity because it has been tampered with or modified from its original state. Availability implies that a resource is always available to who, sh who should have access to whenever they need access to it. Okay, so these three um, um, concepts are what we try to uphold in information security. So anytime any of them suffers or one or more of them suffers, then it is said that you know, you've not guaranteed or you've not ensured information security. Um, do I pause for questions here, if any has come up? Thanks, Samela. Um, it, thank you for bringing this home. Um, personally, having worked with the nonprofits, I find the terms cybersecurity, information security, data security, um, a bit confusing. And so it's great that you, you've touched on that. And on our STEP program, that is something we might actually want to just simplify because I, I also noticed that our documents, some will say, you know, cybersecurity and the others that is information security. So mm -hmm. um, if they, so from what you're saying, it's to mean that there's no big difference from those. You can use them interchangeably. No, so I was just saying that people use them interchangeably, but I guess the main difference is that if you look at the word digital, mm -hmm. digital refer, um, is basically cyber. So digital and cyber to me mm -hmm. mean about the same thing. Okay. Okay. And then if you look at the word information, that's different from digital or cyber. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think the main difference is that information security refers to protecting or securing information in any form it is in. So it could be paper-based information. It could be maybe something you printed on a sheet of paper, something you wrote down. It mm -hmm. could be something in physical form. It mustn't be in soft copy. While mm -hmm. digital or cyber security is focused more on things within the digital sphere or digital space. However, um, as we are starting to see over time, there's a lot of people are now, like you said, mixing the words around. And we're seeing where cyber is used to imply information security, right? Or digital security is used to imply information security. So, but I think the main variance, the main the main difference is the kind of information they are protecting, what format the information in. So if you look at computer security, for instance, now it's referring to population of the computer itself. Mm -hmm. There's also a field called network security. It's referring to population of networks. So these are, while they are in quotes different, they kind of work together. They, they're like a part of a bigger picture, which is information security, because information is stored on computers, on networks, in digital resources, and things like that. So I think they are all they all come together to make up information security. Right. Thank you for that. You're welcome. So do I go on? Or do you have any Tamara? Um, I think we can move forward, um, but just wanted to say thank you for differentiating them because. Um, as Lynette mentioned, um, we do use uh, these terms interchangeably, and it can um, cause some confusion. Yeah, yeah, it's my pleasure. Okay, so now we're going to look at, you know, I've been saying bad guys, bad guys. We're going to look at who the bad guys are. 
Um, in cyber lingo, we call them threat actors. These are the people that you know take actions to cause some form of mayhem or abuse the system or disrupt a service, you know, or to damage a system or tamper with information and things like that. Um, this is a this like are like categories showing the different threat actors and their motivations. So I will start from the bottom, which is to me the most important threat actor. Is you and I, uh, we the humans in our organizations, the insiders, we are people who have legitimate access to resources in our organizations. Mm -hmm. But because of carelessness or ignorance or anger, you know, or any other inducement or reason, we may decide to cause, or well, we may not decide, but we may cause, we may end up causing some form of danger to organizations. So the first, like I said, is insider threats. And um, in this, in, the, in for this motivation that sees this content, it's referring to disgruntled employees, for instance, an employee that has been denied promotion or has been demoted or denied some benefits, excuse me, or maltreated in one way or the other, may feel pushed or feel you know led to do something wrong or cause some danger and they may not necessarily do it for any benefits they may just do it just to spite the organization or to their boss or something like that right so the point here is that they are insiders who can cause us some problems the other side of it is like i said other staff who may not mean bad but because they are not aware they're not aware of digital safety techniques or tips or because of carelessness, they're just careless staff and they do things anyhow and then they don't take the right steps. And so they expose the organization to one danger or the other. Um, we also have third party people, you know, consultants, so suppliers, vendors we use, any other person that's partnering or working together with the organization for one purpose or the other and has access to the organization's resources or data can potentially cause some form of insider threats, even though they are sometimes referred to as third party threats, but they are all some kind of insider or the other. The next category is the thrill seekers. So these are people that just want to try out things, right? They, they have access to some cool software. They have a very nice computer or laptop, and they want to try and see where, what their knowledge has, has been able to gather. And so in the process of trying out these things on different websites, you know, they end up taking down some websites and causing some problems, which may, have, which may, may not have been their actual intention, right? But that was the result of their activities. Um, it, it, uh, there's another group that people tend to put under this group, which are called script kiddies, script kiddies. So these are people that just, again, play around. They don't have any in-depth technical knowledge. They download tools, buy tools, and they configure them and try to use them to try different things out. Sometimes they may do their own for negative reasons, but the idea here is that most of them just do it for some sense of achievement or such. I was able to do this, I was able to, to, you know, to brag to their friends and other people, I was able to achieve this. So we generally call them thrill seekers. Then we have terrorist groups. Um, there are quite a number across the globe, right? I'm not going to mention any names. And their motivation is to just cause some form of violence in the digital space. Um, they go beyond physical violence. They try to um, change how people think, change how people perceive or see them as a way of luring people to join them, as a way of luring people to be sympathetic to their causes or to, in quote, understand why they are doing what they are doing, right? So this has deeper uh, um, uh, implications for the society and for we, the people, uh, based on what we are consuming from them. And so they are also... A, relevant threat actor. We've also seen situations where these terror groups try to attack you know, critical infrastructure of countries or, or to attack people as well. So beyond even the ideological violence, they may actually try to perpetrate some form of cyber attacks on, on other organizations or, or government bodies. Next is hacktivists. So these are, if, as if you can tell, it's like a wordplay on, on hacking and activists, right? So these are people who have strong feelings strong beliefs about certain concepts and believe that you know things should be done this way for the you know for justice to reign or for the betterment of mankind and stuff like that and so when a government or a group of people do something that is deferring or that's opposite to what they believe should be ideal they can take some action we've seen situations where countries have come up with for instance anti-lgbtq policies or laws and we've seen some groups that have gone to attack 
those government websites, you know, take them down or to hijack them and even say, you know, this website has been hijacked by this group just to prove a point and to, as a way of protesting, because that's what activists do, like they protest and push for policy changes and stuff like that. So that's their own way of protesting. So those are activists. Then we have, you know, the main bad guys that we're all familiar with, the cyber criminals. These are the guys that try to do some form of financial fraud. They're always trying to get some money, right? Or if they can't get the money, you have to get the information that they'll use to get money. So those are cyber criminals trying to hack people's email accounts, trying to get in people's banks and stuff like that. Always looking for financial gain. And then the last on the list is nation states. So these are what people call state-sponsored groups or individuals or even um, government bodies themselves that may take certain actions in the cyberspace for to gain geopolitical advantages or security over other countries. So we've seen cases where a country would create a malware to infect another country to cause maybe a slowdown in that country's, in a program the country is doing, a project the country is doing, or to even damage whatever they're doing just so that that country doesn't gain any advantage over them. You've seen cases where countries have tried to get involved in what they call industrial espionage, trying to pay people or to spy on organizations to steal information you know, that they can use maybe to build something or to be at an advantage on that country. These are the kind of things that nation states are known to do generally. I mean, there are other things, but these are like the main ones to mention. I hope my explanations were clear and simple enough. Uh, um, Lynette. Yes, Amela, and the the inside um, attackers, the inside insider threats, eh? that yeah. one also, thank you for shedding more light on that, um, especially around consultants and vendors. And for nonprofits, you also see that um, you most nonprofits engage a lot of um, volunteers or even um, community, yeah, basically volunteers, whether those are um, within the country of operation or even foreign volunteers. And you find that in that interaction, they are accessing very uh, sensitive information uh, regarding yeah. the community members that are being served. We've also seen cases where, you know, the whole thing around working from home you find that um, in your laptop, you're working and you're living with someone else, a family member who comes and accesses very sensitive information around the organization, and especially also financial information. We've, we've had cases like those, and even in human rights organizations where people have been exposed because, you know, they are working from home and their machine landed on the wrong hands. Yeah, so that for me, that was such a highlight on the insider threats and the different forms that uh, they take. And also, now a lot of nonprofits in, in the last decade or so, you'll find most of them, their fundraising entails significantly the process of traveling abroad, you know, to meet with different funders, go for these conferences as a way of networking and, you know, getting to meet new funders. But with COVID-19, with now travel restrictions, you find a lot of people now started relying on their websites um, and their social media to mobilize resources from all kinds of people. And you know what, now it's on social media, really, it's borderless, you know. But then you'll yeah. find that a number of nonprofits have been scammed, especially through their spam mail, when mm -hmm. someone, you know, pretends to be a funder. And mm -hmm. an, 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 unluckily, a lot of CSOs also and nonprofits, sometimes they send too many proposals, they can't remember <laughs> who they sent it to, and so they see this email saying, I'm so-and-so, you know, uh, so-and-so so left a check of a million dollars in support of your work. And, you know, they open that email and it's, it, it just goes downhill from that moment. So insider threats are wide and especially in the nonprofits where a lot of resourcing is, you know, externally um, facing. Yeah, so thanks for that. 
It's my pleasure. I think at some point we're going to discuss a bit about those kind of threats, um, hopefully within the time frame. Um, yeah, so this this is just a, a like a diagram showing the typical steps the attacker takes. I'm not going to cover it in depth. The mm -hmm. idea is just to have an idea, and also a disclaimer is that you know not every attack follows this sequence. So this is just a general um, flow of how attackers work. So the first thing they do is to gather information about who their potential target is, and that's called reconnaissance or recon for short. And so when they gather information, they kind of know, you know, the, for instance, the kind of systems that are used, the kind of um, tools the organization has, the kind of applications that have installed on their systems. And based on that, they're able to start, you know, planning what kind of, um, you know, what, what kind of weak points they need to find. So for instance, if you know that organization uses Windows systems, and they start looking, you know, doing some further research, doing some checks on what um, weaknesses or issues the Windows systems have that they can exploit. In exploit, sorry. So and so that's where they get to the weaponized stage where they start crafting, you know, tools they can use or code they can use to find and exploit vulnerabilities. And so after you know creating what they want to use, they need to find a way to deliver that malware or code to you know, the user. And one of the easiest ways is via email, which is what you've talked about, you know, people trying to scam through emails. It's not just used for scams, it's used to deliver malware, for instance. Or, you know, they can they can lure somebody to a website, come and fill in your NGO details so that you can be considered for this grant. And in process of going to that website, you know, the website is trying to download something on your system to infect your system, you know, and things like that. So there are different ways that they try to deliver, you know, this malicious code to to the users and after they delivered it, they try to, you know, exploit the vulnerability that they found on that system so that the malware can be installed. And when it's installed, the attacker will be able to gain access to that system and take whatever actions the attacker wants to take. So this is typically true in a system hijacking scenario where the attacker's goal is to hijack your system, right? In other kinds of attacks, like I said, you may not follow this sequence, but it's just giving some more insight into how attackers think and how they operate. And so, because we understand these issues are around us and they're everywhere and that everyone is a target, uh, you know, we, we have this belief that it is not a matter of if, but a matter of when, when it comes to hacking and getting compromised, you know. We believe that at some point or the other, everyone will potentially be attacked you know, there's no, you can't, except you are not online, <laughs> you completely be attacked. The difference is that how prepared are you? How resilient are you? Are you an easy target or an easy mark? Or are you resilient and difficult to, to um, you know, for the victim? So we've seen, I'm using Nigeria as an example here, not because Nigeria is the only country that faces these issues, but just because I'm Nigerian and I'm aware of it. And it's easy to find news on your own country. So... Um, yeah, so we are seeing cases of you know yeah, financial fraud, including money laundry, um, and what they call advanced fee fraud, where people ask you to pay to be part of a deal, and then they get away with your money and don't get back to you. Or where someone tells you that oh, you've won, you've been you've been you've been listed in someone's you know in a will, and you're supposed to inherit two hundred thousand dollars, but you need to pay two thousand dollars to get access to that money and things like that. You've seen those kind of scenarios. And we've seen where, you know, even infrastructure, government infrastructure get attacked, you know, and government websites and web applications and other critical national infrastructure get attacked. And also, as you can see, as well as we are aware of in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, there's been a lot of, um, um, there's a lot of cyber angle to the matter. It's not just the physical attacks that are going on. We've seen some um, cyber aggression as well. And so, what is the impact of so of all these dangers I've mentioned and all these risks or threats? What is the potential impact on us as individuals and potentially as organizations? You know, so for organizations, typically there's reputational damage. You can imagine a bank that you have your life savings in when you hear that that bank has been hacked. You know, you potentially risk to the bank to go and empty your account. You, you probably even don't want to bank with anybody again. You just want to have your cash, like your money in cash. 
so you can see it and know that it's safe, right? Um, and so that means that a lot of people tend to not trust that organization anymore. They lose confidence in the organization. I mean, even the investors you know, or stakeholders, people who may hold stocks and all that, they lose confidence in the organization, which will lead to loss of money or loss of revenue, which can potentially lead to bankruptcy or even extinction of a brand. We've also seen scenarios where because of government regulation and one law or the other, there are some fines and potential legal um, sanctions that may come from a regulator because of um, something they've done or something that led to his cyber attack that was their fault. We've also seen where because of this um, hacking or this breach, we've seen where certain information or confidential or corporate information, intellectual property as well, can be stolen or even resold or abused or used by the attackers, right? So there are so many things that I've not mentioned, but I think these are the, like the broad expected impact on organizations, right? For, for the people side of things, you know, there's what we call a privacy breach, where information that you hold there, information that you typically don't want to be in public domain can potentially now go to the public domain, right? There's still the uh, room for financial loss, there's the room for identity theft, where someone hacks your email and sends emails to other people as you. You've seen this happen in social media as well, where they hack people's Instagram accounts and send direct messages to all their contacts saying, oh, um, I lost my phone, I'm sharing this with, can you send me you know, just $10 so I can get a train ticket back home or a bus ticket back home? And you know, it's small money, you're not worried, and it's your friend. So you help the person, not knowing that it's an attacker, that has hacked the person's Instagram account and sent that same message to the 1,000 followers and potentially we get $10,000 if everyone responds. So these are the kind of things that can happen to individuals as well. Again, there are many other um, scenarios of potential impact. We've seen where because of the embarrassment or things that have come out from the attacks, people have you know become depressed, people have potentially committed suicide or have you know, change schools because of the embarrassment, people laughing at them because the information leaked and stuff like that. A lot of things have happened. So um, they, are, they are very grave um, impacts of these issues. Um, before I go on, do you have any questions on what we've covered lately? All clear from my end, Tamara? Same here, no questions. Awesome. And so when we look at, um, you know, the solutions or how to implement safety measures, we look at it from three angles. The angle of the people, the angle of the processes that you have in place, and the kind of technologies you use, what technologies you can leverage. For the people, we're looking at the users, the everyday staff, we're looking at the IT guys, the security guys, management staff, you know, the people who are involved or who have some form of interaction with our systems and our data. We also look at the process, what kind of guidelines do you have? Do you have organization policy that informs how users should behave or how staff should handle data or how staff should work? Are there international standards that you try to comply with or abide by? Are they uh, um, government or uh, government regulations or are they laws, you know, that you need to abide by? And then from the angle of technology, are there tools you can use to enforce some of these security measures uh, or, to, or to protect yourself or to detect when something has gone wrong, you know, or to fix the problem when you find a the problem? These are some of the things we try to look at under these issues. So I'll start with the people side of things, right? I mentioned that when the attackers pick someone as a target, one of the first things they do is to gather information. As you can guess, the average user today potentially has 15 and above online accounts. If you look at it from the angle of entertainment, people have Spotify, Netflix, Apple Music, and so on. Look at it from the angle of emails, people have work email and potentially multiple personal emails. They have emails from school as well. If you look at banking, some people bank with about three, four, five banks, and so on. And so if you keep counting, you easily gets the average internet user with about 15 accounts. And so a lot of people have multiple social media accounts. The basic ones being Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and so on and so forth. And one of the things we do on social media is to, sh is to share information, right? We're either posting or reposting someone else's information. What we tend to forget is that 
over time, if someone is gathering this information, something that should be benign or should be uh, not something that should be malicious can potentially be aggregated to form something that can be used against us. So, for instance, you are always talking about how your your kid, you know, your five year old kid is a genius, right? How is the best in the class? It's always performing, winning awards. And so, out of excitement, you go on Instagram and you post a picture of your child receiving yet another award, which you can't blame any parent for being proud of their child, right? And you post the child of, uh, so you, you you post a picture of your child, you know, maybe showing the child receiving the award, and the the, the award has you know, the name of the school or there's a badge on the child's dress that shows the logo of the school. And potentially people already know where you live because you've complained about one issue or the other. Maybe there's no light or the road is bad or healthcare is bad. So you potentially complain about where you live and people tend to know the city you live in. You've basically told any potential kidnapper, you know, where your child schools. And so if they can't get to you, the next thing is to get to your loved ones, right? Um, another thing, another example where I have on the screen here is that you talk about how um, your boss is traveling, right? It, it seems like just something normal to say, my boss is going for a conference to attend a UN discussion on, you know, um, climate change, for instance. Forgetting that you've also posted a picture with you and your boss, potentially people know who your boss is and anyone who is targeting your boss will be looking at you who happens to be their maybe PA or next in command. And so they potentially know that your boss is traveling. And so if they are armed robbers, for instance, they know that the boss's house is potentially empty in that period, or the boss who may be maybe the strongest person in the family is not going to be around, and so the family is vulnerable. So these are just ways that the simple, normal stuff we share can potentially yield negative impact if it gets into the hands of the wrong person. And, you know, the the the... The thing about the internet is that it's not just used by good people. There's no filtering measure. They, they don't come to check, do any background check and ask you, who are you? Have you come to the crime before? You know, anyone can create an account. In fact, we see a, quite a number of anonymous accounts on social media today. So we are sharing the internet with potentially, you know, very malicious people, murderers, pedophiles, um, robbers, and all manner of bad people. And so we need to be careful, very, very careful what we share online. That's just the summary of this. Um, point I'm making. And so another important point and why I keep talking about the people side of things is because you know you can't you can't have security without a letter you can't spell security without you. So basically there's no security without you. So it implies that everyone has a role to play. If you look at the team at the bottom of the screen, there are three people, the guy in front, you know, I mean, judging by the haircut and the nice suit, you can assume is the boss, right? You can see that the boss is involved and the subordinates are involved. So basically, everybody in the team is working together to make sure they achieve the goal. And what is the goal? The goal is making sure your organization is not vulnerable to attacks, right? So everyone has a role to play in your organization. And so as we learn about the things we can do, the steps we can take, let's also think about how you can, uh, I don't want to say domesticate, but domesticate it and make it personal. You know, what can I do in my own position in my organization or in my family, for instance, to ensure that we are not vulnerable, right? And at the top of my screen, there's an onion there. There's something, you know, there, there, are, there are so many ways to go about this issue. The idea is that there's no one single solution you can, can ever use in cyber security or in digital security to protect yourself. But you need different layers. You need multiple things working together, complementing each other to build that resilience, right? And so there are what we call controls, which are just like security measures. There are controls that you can use. And this is just for knowledge sake. Um, this is more for the IT guys to know about, but I'll just mention it. There are physical controls, which are physical items that um, are used to enforce some kind of security measures. We tend to see them... Um, used in terms of access control. So for instance, to get, if anyone wants to gain access to a sensitive area, you need to provide your ID card to use it on the scanner or your fingerprint and things like that. And so those kind of sensors and devices are referred to as um, physical controls, so like gates and other things like that. We have administrative controls. These are things that are uh, largely have to do with proce uh, processes and documentation. So like your policies or guidelines or regulations and stuff like that or I mean within the organization. Then you have legal controls. This have to do with maybe put um, outside the organization's jurisdiction in terms of maybe in a state level or a country level or a global level. There may be certain 
laws that you have to apply and she has to comply with. Some people don't separate legal from administrative, but I uh, decided to do that here. And then we have technical control. These are tools or equipment you can use to improve your security, like tools like um, anti malware or what they call firewalls to protect your networks and other solutions that are being used. Now, at the individual level, I'm just going to run us through about 10 things we can do, practical steps you can take. You know, so beyond those jargons about physical controls and technical controls, these are actual steps you can take to break it down. The first one is to update your devices and your applications. We tend to forget, if I may use that word, to click on updates when it pops up on our phones. Maybe you're too busy doing something or you're working on a document on your laptop and you get the, update, the prompt that you have an update. And so we ignore the update and say, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it next week. Not knowing that sometimes these updates are there to fix security um, gaps. They're trying to block weak points or strengthen weak points and block gaps in your system security. And so when you don't, when you put up that update and don't install the update, you're leaving yourself vulnerable to any potential attack that may happen in that period, right? So it's very important that all your devices, updates are not just to improve the features or functionality. There are a lot of times also to improve the security of that application or device. Next is for us to adopt the habit of using strong passwords. We want to make sure that you're not using a password that's easy to guess. We want to make sure you don't share your password with people. You don't just write it on a sticky note and put it on your table or in your, the first drawer in your office. You know, it's a password that has to do with your name or your family name or your, you know, something that can be easily traced back to you. you don't want to use those kind of passwords. You want to make sure your password it has reasonable length. We're talking about 12 characters being the standard these days, you know. And talking about some level of complexity, helping adding a few numbers and symbols to just to make it stronger. So these are some considerations when looking at strong passwords. But we also advise that because of the multiple accounts we have, you know, creating unique passwords for every account can become a hassle. In fact, it can become impossible to remember them. If not, you may end up just doing password resets every single time you want to log in. So what do we advise? Get what we call a password manager. This is a tool that helps you generate strong passwords to store the passwords for you securely so that anyone who gains access to your device cannot see the password, right? You can potentially also use password managers across platforms. So on your laptop, on your desktop, on your phone, on your tablet, you can access the password manager and access your, you can access your password bank. All you have to do is just remember the master password that gives you access to this password manager. So it makes it easier in the sense that you just need to remember one password. However, this also means that it's a single point of failure because if the person somehow gets your master password and has access to your device, then potentially they can gain access to all your passwords. However, it's not too common for that to happen because they need to get both your they need to get both access to your laptop and access to the password manager. Um, next advice is to lock your devices. So many of us have our phones and laptops that we do not lock. So there may be a password, but when we sleep it, for instance, it may not ask you to log in to come back. And sometimes we may decide to quickly answer somebody in the next office and leave our laptops unattended to. You know, we assume all our colleagues mean well. We don't know that there's potentially someone inside the organization that may be rogue and decide to commit a crime with your device, making you a potential suspect, you know. So we need to be careful about our devices. Always lock them. Same thing applies to our phones, our tablets. Always make sure they are locked. This is very helpful in the case of theft. If your device gets stolen, then the attacker cannot, the thief rather, cannot use it or cannot see your information except they're able to somehow crack the lock, which is not too easy to do. Next is to enable what we call multi-factor authentication. What this does for you is that beyond the usual username and password requirement to log into most platforms, it asks for an additional piece of information. Now, this could be your fingerprint. It could be a code that will be sent to your phone or a code you can generate from another device, you know, and things like that. So the idea is that it's not just what you know, which is your username and password. The one is they want you to add another layer, which could be something you have, like your a token device that a lot of banks use, or it could be something about you, which is like your fingerprint or facial scan or, or retina scan and other things like that. So 
whenever you see this feature on any platform or any software, please make sure you enable it and reuse it. It's very, very important. Last five, try to get a trusted anti-malware solution. It's important that your devices are protected from malware. A lot of malware can cause us a lot of issues and they can be used to gain access to confidential information. So we need to make sure we have them so our devices do not get compromised. We need to back up your data. Um, this is very important in case your laptop gets stolen or damaged or infected. So there's a malware, for instance, called ransomware. What it does is that it, um, it scrambles your data so that you cannot use it, you can't access it, you can't understand what it is anymore. And so you can imagine an organization and the whole organization's data is scrambled. You can't work, you know. You can imagine it happening to like a bank. What will happen to that bank if it happens for just um, two hours in a day? What will happen, the potential losses that could happen? And so it's important to back up your data so that in case anything goes wrong, you know, you have um, clean data that you can restore and reuse on your, on your system. Um, Something important to mention for backups, there are multiple ways to backup. You know, you can use cloud, which is online. You can use a hard drive or a storage device to keep it offline. Or you can use a, a server or, or yeah, you can have a local backup within the organizations. And organizations have a separate location to store their backed up data in case of something like fire, for instance. If it burns the whole office, they say have their data stored in a different location. So these are different ways to backup that organizations can consider. And very important to secure your Wi-Fi. Many at times we buy, you know, we set up the Wi-Fi connection in the office and we just leave the default credentials, you know, the same one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pin, or the same admin admin um, credentials for the back end. You know, it's very important that whenever you buy a device or tool, always change the default credentials. Never leave it with the default credentials. Always change it because that default is used everywhere. And so a lot of people know the default. <laughs> Excuse me. So if someone malicious gets access to that device, they potentially know the default if you haven't changed and they will try it. So it's always important to secure your Wi-Fi because you do not want someone malicious having access to your network, potentially trying to see what's happening on the network and causing one issue or the other. Next, okay, I already talked about the first credentials it goes with securing your Wi-Fi. And the last is partly what you're doing, which is to enlighten the users. If you do not train your employees or your staff, you're basically making them your weakest point. You know, technology can be, if, if, if the technology is configured well, you know, it will do its job, it's cool, it will run its code as it should. If your processes are structured well, they will serve the purpose. If the users, however, are not trained, no matter how good the software is or the process is, they would make mistakes, they will ignore some processes, and so you will still be vulnerable. So training your staff, training your users, it's like the most important of all these things I've talked about because a trained eye, you know, can be your first line of defense. So um, it's a very, very, very vital thing to do. And so just to round up, key points, you know, we need to take ownership of our security. You know, everyone has a role to play. It's everyone's responsibility. So like I said, whether it's in your office or in your families, you know, you could potentially have people who are victims of cyber crime or some form of cyber attack. So it's our job to enlighten them. In our organizations, you know, some people say it's expensive. You can't do anything about it. Not, not necessarily. There are basic step, steps you can take. So I've given us 10 examples of things we can do. About eight of them do not necessarily require you to spend any money. You know, so start with the basics, start with the simple things. We find that a lot of people ignore the fundamentals, the basics, and they try to go for the expensive stuff and they just find themselves lost. So start with the basics. Try to stay current, you know. Try to understand what's happening in the industry. What kind of scams are the scammers running today? What kind of tools are people using to secure themselves? What kind of um, trends you know, are happening in this space so that you understand you know, what kind of attacks are other NGOs facing so that you can potentially prepare yourself for those kind of things. It's important to stay current. And lastly, like we've talked about one more time, you know, enlighten everyone, your colleagues, your friends, your family members, let everyone be cyber aware so that they can protect themselves. Thank you very much for listening and for giving me your ears and your time. Happy to take any questions you may have at this point. Um, yes, uh, thank you so much um, for this presentation. Um, I've personally learned a lot 
Um, I have a few questions on my mind, but um, I guess the main one is, um, so if an organization is just getting started um, to apply these safety measures, um, what are your recommendations for, you know, top three fundamentals that they should, that they should, I, I know it is quite a few, <laughs> but if you could choose three that the organization needs to implement when they're first getting started in this, what would your recommendations be? Hmm. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Maybe it'd be difficult to narrow it down to three, but considering how so now organizations don't necessarily work in the same office. So securing a network now is more complicated because everyone has their own network at home. So I won't talk about that. I will say a key one is the use of multi factor authentication. So generally anything that's to do with authentication, that's from using strong passwords to using password managers to the use of multi-factor authentication. Because a lot of attacks, you know, when someone gain, gains access to your email, for instance, a lot, so many other things can happen. It's like, it, like it may not necessarily be identity theft. They could use your email to commit fraud. Mm -hmm. They could use your email to send malicious stuff to people. You could use your email to even so it's for funds, you know, you could reach out to vendors and say, oh yeah, oh, you need to make this payment. Don't make it next week or make the payments for this month into this account. And so you siphon the money. You know, so anything that's the authentication is very important. And so the use of strong passwords, the use of password managers and enabling multi-factor authentication to make sure that people do not easily get access to your account, even if they have mm. the passwords. You know, I would combine those three as one point. <laughs> as one very valuable point, right? The second I'll talk about is the need to update our devices and applications. So our devices you know they are software built by human beings and a lot of times they may come with flaws that even the creators may not have seen at the point of you know putting it out in the public for use but over time as they use and as they get feedback from people and as they do their own research they may come across issues and so they try to fix these issues and that's why they put out a lot of these updates and so when you do not do the updates you're basically telling the bad guys who may now be aware of those issues because when they put out the update they will explain this is why we are doing these updates. These are the things we're trying to fix. The bad guys also read those blog posts that Microsoft will post, for instance, and they'll say, oh, so there's this flaw you can exploit. And so when they go around, maybe only 20% of people do the updates on the first day. Maybe by the end of the first week, only 50% are done, meaning that the attackers have a week to potentially target 50% of people who may not. And I'm using that as a raw figure, but I'm sure it may be higher than that that we don't install in the first week, right? And so you are making yourself vulnerable because the bad guys now know the weaknesses and they are figuring out ways to exploit those weaknesses. Meanwhile, you've not done your updates to make sure that you can't be a victim. Last, 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 again, talk, since we have distributed teams, our teams work across different locations. That means our devices are very important and our devices need to be secure. So I think my last or my third point would be to install a trusted anti-malware solution. This will help you with a lot of attacks that you may not even see or spot with your eye. Some of them will get blocked automatically and just get a prompt that this has been blocked. So I think it's very helpful. Again, three is a small list. There's so many other things. I don't want to mm -hmm. <laughs> go beyond the time. You know, but I think okay. those three are for me will be the key things to start with. And you can get some free ones. Although the suggestion is always to do your research before you use any tool or software, do your research. There are always people who have done reviews and people who have done comparisons. So make sure you are using something that's from a, a credible organization. You're not using something that says it's doing A, meanwhile it's doing B in the background, right? So always do your research before you get any tool or software installed in your organization. Yeah, thank you. Um, for that. I know it was difficult to pick just three <laughs> um, since they are all very important. Um, I do want to say that I really appreciate you highlighting um, um, the enlightening others and uh, training your staff. Um, I think that um, is a very important factor to this because you don't, um, you, you know, usually speaking, you, you're not aware of these things until someone tells you or this happens to someone else. Uh, personally, yeah. before TechSoup, I worked at smaller nonprofits, um, and you know, it's most it was mostly emergency relief. 
Um, so you don't really have time to talk about data security and data protection and and all of these important fundamentals because those are things that can put your nonprofit at risk or even the people that you are serving at risk. Um, and so I personally feel very thankful for TechSoup to have um, provided that training for us um, and hope to learn more throughout that training. Um, but yeah, I believe that I think that's a very important point um, because you don't want to get to this happening to you or this happening to someone else in order for you to think that, okay, like this is serious. Um, our organization needs to tackle this. Exactly. It's my pleasure. Um, I do have another question. Um, do you, and maybe this is open for discussion with Lynette as well. Um, do you feel that the nonprofit sector um, is impacted the same way as the corporate sector? Um, or there are some key differences in terms of um, typical threats or actors? I would say there are some differences. So yes, I agree that the nonprofit sector, I think because of the kind of money flowing through it and the kind of awareness people are gaining about nonprofits, there's more interest in what they do. Two examples I'll use. For instance, the cyber criminals know that you guys are getting funding from, you know, for instance, maybe Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, from the UN, from you know, all these big international or global organizations. And they're, they're foreseeing potential millions of dollars flowing from left to right, right to left, and things like that. And so they want to partake in the cake. They want to taste it. They want to have a share of the money. And so they potentially try to target those based on, you know, usually you announce, oh, we're thankful to maybe to Microsoft for sponsoring this, 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 and you heal them and you're happy on your LinkedIn. And the attackers are like, oh, they got $2 million from Microsoft. You know, and so they're potentially not targeting maybe your CFO or the CEO of the nonprofit and things like that. That's one side of the issue, the financial side. The other side is um, potentially a lot of nonprofits do things that a lot of governments frown upon. So, for instance, some nonprofits are reporting, you know, their, their media nonprofits, civil society organizations, for instance, reporting about maybe election. Or about climate change impacts, or about you know lack of diversity and or politics or you know different things like that, and these things are, are even something like good governance, you know, which people should ordinarily like, you know, but these things could offend certain governments or certain government bodies or even individuals within the government or who have access to state resources, and so they can decide to potentially target a nonprofit for that reason. And we've seen this happening across Africa, for instance, and even beyond, where an organization reporting a particular issue suddenly starts getting their websites attacked or suddenly starts receiving a bunch of phishing emails to hijack, to try, to try and gain access to their email accounts and stuff like that. We've seen where websites are censored in the sense that no one from that country can even gain access to that website. So you can't even go and read more about the news the, the organization is talking about, you know. And these kind of things happen. And so I think potentially these are the two kinds of dangers that, like beyond the general dangers, you know, you still face online. These are the two that I potentially see targeting non-profit nonprofits. And it's simply because of who they are affiliated with and what they do. So there's more reason for people who work in this industry to be very cautious, to be very careful, and to learn more about digital security. Thank you. Yeah. Um, those are all very important points. Um, thank you for answering my question. Uh, Lynette, do you have any questions? No, um, I'm very thankful that we got to have this session. One of the practical things we can do on our end is just do a quick checklist on the 10 um, ways that Samila had, has given us, especially the ones that don't require any resources, financial resources, and we can have that in the step uh, resource portal yes. so that people can just go there and check, you know, have they done these basic steps before? Mm -hmm. So thank you, Samela. This was really good. It's my pleasure. Thank, thank you for that suggestion, Lena. I think that's a great idea. Um, 
And uh, thank you, Samela, for this presentation um, and for taking the time to meet with us. Happy to do this.